My name's Jeff Bajoric, and my career in sales has been a hell of a ride. And I want to bring you along with me. If you prefer to sell things at a premium, if you never want to win a deal on price, rethink the way you sell. Welcome back to the show. My name is Jeff Bajoric. I'm your host, and I'm here to help you rethink the way you sell. Today, I've got my friend David Weiss on with me. David is the chief revenue officer at a company called The Sales Collective that I've done a little bit of work with. Um, David, I'll let you tell The Sales Collective, or I'll let you tell everybody what The Sales Collective does, but what we're going to talk today about a deal management tool that you've been using and, and, and referring to for uh, years now, really as long as I've known you, and uh, I want to dig into that particularly because um, we're talking about the, the seven steps to sell like you. And step six is be held accountable in some way. And if you're listening or if you're watching us on YouTube or Spotify right now, you should go back and listen to that episode that I released last week uh, where I said self-accountability is a myth. It's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as self-accountability. By definition, someone who supports you, someone who has your best interest in mind should be looking after you. That's what accountability is. Uh, Self-accountability, as most people describe it, is just really discipline. And discipline's important, but it's not the same as accountability. So I want to be clear about that. And I also, uh, David, uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself and then let's talk about some of the tools that you've used, that you've seen throughout your career that help people at least mark their own progress against uh, the deals that they, they, they need to make. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, Jeff, as you mentioned, you know, David Weiss, CRO, Sales Collective, uh, Sales Collective um, Think Tank, Sales Transformation Company. Our job is to go into an organization, evaluate the how they sell motion, uh, how they go to market, and whether it's building process, hiring people, training and developing um, their folks, uh, coaching them, or you know, installing fractional you know sales leaders like yourself um, to. Uh, help them, you know, build things and and work with their people and design and execute strategy. You know, that's what we do. Um, on the side, as you mentioned, for years I've been talking about, um, you know, ways that people can see gaps in deals. And you know, there's a lot to do that. You know, winning by design has spiced. Um, gap has their thing. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the the popular. Uh, deal management methodology known as like medic or medic or med pick. Um, so, you know, I teach a lot uh, around that, whichever one you use. The whole point with them is as you're executing the, how you sell motion, how you've been trained to sell, we want to look at what might you have missed inside that motion and use the lens of one of these popular frameworks to do it. Got it. So where do you start and why do you start there? And and I guess, how, how do you know? Well, let's start here. <laughs> Let me just answer my own question. Why don't we yeah. start at the start? How do you know when you need one of these? When is a deal uh, simple enough that you don't need a tool? And when is a deal mm -hmm. complex enough uh, that you might want to start considering this? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, and I've gotten asked that question a lot. Um, I was on a, with my friend Andy White, who uh, runs uh, a Medic, and uh, we were we were actually talking about that exact thing. And I got uh, MedPick all the way down to door to door pest control being effective, which most people think is pretty you know transactional. Pretty like transactional, kind of yes so, or no. When you're selling door to door, it's kind of. <laughs> 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 so look, um, to me, this is just level of scrutiny. Um, one of the reasons I like, you know, uh, the popular methodology MedPick um, is because uh, it had, to me, it's the foundational building blocks of all deals. Um, metrics, business case, all deals need to have some typically financial justification for making a change. There needs to be someone who is either creating budget or aligning budget to that thing. They have some criteria they want. They have some process they're going to use to buy. There needs to be some degree of pain and reason to change and the implication of it. There's likely needs to be a, you know, champion, someone in the ear of the person making the decision. That's like, yeah, you know, make this decision. Um, and then you're probably competing uh, against something. Uh, inside of your deal, whether it's status quo or an actual competitor. Um, 
the example of door to door pest control, you know, was that like, you know, if I, if my wife owns the budget and is making the decision on what pest control we use, I'd be the champion. Um, you know, I'd have criteria. Do I want my whole yard done? Do I want it granulated? You know, do I, how I like what chemicals do I want them to use? Do I, cause I got, a, I got a pet, so I want it to be certain eco friendly. You know, I've got a process cause my, my pest control service is up. Uh, you know, in three months, so I can't buy it now, but I can buy it then. I'm competing against another pest control company. You know, so like, look, all all of those things are factors in every deal. So the point is, in very fast transactional, maybe all of those are in the back of your mind. You're not writing them down. You're not pressure testing them. You're not going deep. You're just in your mind saying, hey, have I figured out all this, all these things? Or, you know, when you're starting to run and to answer your question more directly, when, not, when I'm starting to see deals that are three, six months, year, two years, multi-year long, that are in like 30, 50, 100 plus thousand dollars, more complexity, that's when I'm starting to go really deep. That's when I'm doing lots of documentation. That's when I'm really pressure testing a lot of my thoughts and ideas, um, you know, things along those lines. Got it. So what does your favorite framework look like? And what are those steps? Like, what are you asking people to do gap analysis on? What are the things that they need to pay attention to that they're probably not? So I'm a uh, medic, M-E-D-D-I-C-C, or med pick, M-E-D-D-P-I-C-C guy. Um, the difference is the one letter is the P, which is paper process. So here's how you determine which one you should use. If you have a complex legal process, you know, your legal process takes a month or more because there's lots of red lines and terms and uh, inside outside counsel and just general complexity, bigger enterprise deals. Uh, you have the paper process. I've grown up in you know million dollar outsourcing and big enterprise deals. So paper process is really important because the business may want to buy it. And I may want to forecast it because they want to buy it, but they can't buy it for another couple of months because I know we're going to have to work through the legal stuff. So paper process is inserted as a more granular way to look at the legal process. So your forecast date is accurate. So like, that's the major difference. So, you know, again, my framework, um, let's, let's go with MedPIC, M-E-D-D-P-I-C-C. M is just your metrics and your and you know, with metrics, you got to go beyond metrics because Metrics by themselves is, is nothing. It's, it's just numbers on a page. Um, what is the me- what story is the metric telling you? Um, what's, the, what's the implication of moving the lever and the needle on those metrics? That, that's what you use to build a business case. So, you know, I'm asking myself on that one, um, do I have metrics? That's like, you know, the starting point. If I do, um, that's kind of like, cool. But what does that metric mean? And once I understand and can quantify what that metric means, the implication... Um, and I use that to build a financial business case, um, you know, that goes to yellow and then, you know, I'm going to green on a, on a metric, um, when it's been validated by an economic buyer, uh, because ultimately my champion may think, you know, the metric and the business case tied to it, um, will get the deal done, but ultimately the economic buyer, if they don't look at it, de-risk it, challenge it, believe it, align it to a priority, it's not real. So that's just like, just like an example. An example. When you talk about metrics, I've seen sales reps go way too deep into this, trying to prove an ROI before they really have any case built around a COI, right? And the return on investment doesn't mean anything until we have some idea around a cost of an action. And cost of an action is really tough to quantify because a lot of times we have to think in bigger and bigger chunks, right? Well, if you don't solve this problem, then what happens? And then what happens? And then what happens? And, you know, you get that like the, that engineering term of the cone of uncertainty gets bigger and bigger the further out you look. You have to do that in order to get the buyer emotionally involved. Um, but I, I see too many reps trying to tie hard numbers to something that really... We don't need to know what those numbers are as salespeople, so long as the prospect has an idea of what those numbers could be in their own heads, especially when they're, um, you know, when when they're far out like that. So, I mean, how do you manage to, how do you manage to identify the right metrics to ask for without having reps get too caught in the weeds with stuff that they really have no means of finding out this early in the process? Yeah. So it's, it's it, there's a. Um, well, I'll answer your first question. Uh, the metrics you should focus on are the, are the metrics you should you impact. So, like, um, interview interview your customers. Historically speaking, when someone bought your solution, what changed? 
and how much did it change by? Cool. Aggregate that number. Um, use it as an average. And then when you go talk to your clients, you say, look, um, solution. These are the things that will change. And this is how much they'll change by. And if they change by that much for you, what would that mean to you? Easiest place to start. Like right there, you can build a pretty decent business case around. Um, what's, what's interesting about the cost of an action and how I actually have found really easy ways to quantify it um, is I take the uh, agreed upon ROI. And the keyword there is agreed upon. I'm going to move these needles. I'm going to move them in these levers. I'm going to move this much because that's historically what we do. Do you believe we can do that? Yes. Okay. Or no, I don't think you can move it by 30% on these things. I think it's cool. Can we agree on 20%? Yeah, we can agree on 20%. Okay. So what's the ROI on that? And I take that ROI and I divide it by 250 days. That's the number of working days in a year. So you take that number, you take the, the big ROI at the end of the year, you divide it by 250. And then that's literally every day they don't make a change. That's the potential cost of an action. And I call it daily lost revenue, um, but it's cost of an action. And that's a really easy way to, to make the cost of an action and the long term ROI Tangent. kind of come together. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So beyond metrics, because we could talk about, we have actually, and, and if you want to know, the details that I have talked to David about and the lengths to which we've dived deep into this. I've got all kinds of content that I can point you to, but David, we've got uh, limited time here today on this show. I try to keep these episodes short. What what comes after M? What comes after the metrics? So you got economic buyer. The key thing with economic buyer, and I'm not going to go deep on any of these, but the key thing with economic buyers is the person who can create budget for good ideas. So um, what's really interesting about the economic buyer is like most people, like let's say you're selling an HR solution. They think the CHRO would be the economic buyer, right? They're the ones that are the highest level in HR. They'd sign the contract. No. For a budgeted expense, the CHRO is likely the economic buyer. They can spend the budget they've been given. But CHROs don't create budget. So for an unbudgeted expense, and if they don't have free discretionary funds left, the economic buyer now becomes probably the CFO or CEO, the person who can create budget. And the champion now becomes the CHRO, where the champion before was probably the VPHR, the one step below the economic buyer. And the economic buyer was the CHRO for a budgeted expense. So that's that's economic buyer, and it shifts based on budgeted and unbudgeted and discretionary spending levels. I don't disagree. I was actually talking to someone, though, who was trying to target the economic buyer without targeting the person whose problem it was. Give me 30 seconds on that. Because the CFO, in a, for unbudgeted stuff, where you got to find money, which is different than budget, which is the question I was going to ask you, and then you answered it before I could. But if people need to find money because it's not in the budget, then yeah, someone with revenue in their title, either a VP or a C-level is going to have that. Um, sorry, finance in their title, not revenue, um, is going to have that. But that's probably not the person you want to talk to first, right? Because they don't have the context for why that's a problem. Well, yeah. And also, you don't know if it's a budgeted or unbudgeted expense. You don't know until you talk to them if they were, have been planning on deploying a solution like you, like the one you sell, and you just happen to catch them at the right time. And, you know, cool. Like, the economic buyer would, in that case, be the CHRO um, because they, it's a budgeted expense. So I'm a, I'm a fan of, you know, the economic buyer is essentially the head of the function from a pain and problem perspective to start. And then once you figure out if it's budgeted or unbudgeted, then that assumption naturally changes. But yes, there's no reason to ask someone for money for something or to create money for something <laughs> until a problem around that thing has been you know, identified. It, right. We solve problems. We don't sell products. First and foremost, we solve problems, right? Um, all right. So we went through M and E. What's the first D, David? Uh, decision criteria. So uh, think of that as the wish list. These, this is what someone wants in, in, in a solution. What's really important there is the alignment between your solution and somebody else's. You know, let's let's use you know the the HR example just because we're going down that path right now. Um, you know, if if they're looking to, um, you know, uh, um, fill positions, they need they need more salespeople. Do they 
I may sell a recruiting service, but it doesn't mean they want to solve the problem using an outsourced recruiter. They may want to have, they may view it as a core competency and want an internal recruiter. So the fact that you sell outsourcing doesn't fucking matter. They will all with their own people. This, um, this, this episode is uh, rated E for David Weiss. <laughs> so um, your salute, you, you need to understand the criteria that they want to buy and it needs to be aligned with how they want to solve it and how you specifically solve it. Um, and you may do five or 10 things and they may only need five things and therefore you're too bloated or not enough. So it's just really how well are you aligned to you know, how they want to solve it. Tailor what you do to what they need. Uh, second, D, decision process. Um, that's the think of it as a, a backwards decision timeline. Think of it as a, your mutual action plan. Um, very, very simply, it is the process they are going to go through as a business to buy, accounting for all the needed people and steps and things you know involved in, in that. Um, we've talked about P as the paper process. I, I, the implication of pain, not, uh, not just identifying it, but the implication of it. So, um, they have a problem. Who's it impacting? Um, how is it impacting them? Why does it matter? Uh, getting to that level, uh, where, and honestly, like, I'm going to make one comment here because this is where I think reps mess up. Um, they treat discovery as a single action to find pain and then sell. Um, what I want to share is uh, if you know that your solution typically has four, five, six, seven, ten stakeholders involved in the decision, or your solution is complex enough that you know it can impact multiple parts of the business, um, your the implication of pain is not complete until you've done a circular motion with all those required people um, to be able to fully understand the different perspectives and the different ways that your solution or the different problems that people have that your solution can solve. Um, I think we're on to C. We have two C's, right? We got two C's. Uh, two C's. Let's talk C's. Competition. Okay. Um, so I don't have any competition, David. I sell a bespoke solution. There's no competition for me. But Jorik's been telling me that competition doesn't matter. Tell me why. Tell, tell everybody why competition matters. Competition absolutely matters. Um, <laughs> 57% of all deals are a loss of status quo. Um, your biggest competitor, by the way. Quo. Yeah. You're, com you're competing against uh, why change? Why now? Um, you're competing against other you know, budgets. You're competing against other priorities. Um, and then you're also competing against you know, potentially you know, other outside forces, um, including... Um, direct competitors, but outside forces could easily be economic factors. Um, could be, could be a lot of different things. And then, uh, yeah, last C is, uh, is your champions. So champion is defined. Uh, and this and champion, Jeff, maybe the most misused word in all of sales. Uh, the, the champion is not a coach. It's not an influencer. Um, it's not an end user. It's not your best friend. It's not somebody that likes you. Uh, a champion is defined as one step below an economic buyer. The champion can change based on budgeted or unbudgeted expense. Uh, they need to be selling for you uh, when you are not there, and they need to be tested to actually be a champion. And they can go from being a champion to not being a champion pretty darn quick. So I've got um, two questions around this framework. Um, <laughs> the first is, uh, where can people find it? You've written about this. You've podcasted about this. I'm not the first person you've talked about this. Where can people learn a little bit more around this? And then my next question has to deal with how do you handle people who say, man, this is a lot. I don't know if I can manage it. So where can people find more and how simple is it to actually, you know, put into play? Yeah. So uh, people can find me on LinkedIn. I'm all over LinkedIn. Uh, if you can't find me on LinkedIn, uh, you're spelling my name wrong. Um, so so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll link in the show notes. You will, you will be able to just one click and you'll be right to David. So don't worry yeah. about that. But so uh, anybody who says this sounds like a lot, um, you know, I thought that way too, when I first started doing it, I can now med pick a deal or medic a deal, what have you, uh, in probably about five minutes, maybe less. Uh, the, if someone gets really good at it, 
literally in the back of your mind. Like my example a few minutes ago of like the door to door pest control. I did that in like eight seconds, like 10 seconds. Like that's just, that was fast. Um, when you get really good at this, it becomes second nature and you can just very quickly ask yourself some very basic questions about the deal, find out where you have a problem inside of, of that line of questioning and then uh, take action and do something about it. So it's really not that hard. Just how long yeah. did, how long did it take you to get that level of mastery though? Like eight, 10 seconds. That's fine. Now you're yeah. just bragging. But I mean, like how, how long, because look, we're talking about, you know, we've got uh, eight letters. Some of them are doubled, but, you know, where, where, what this, I mean, you can write it all out on a sheet and, and look, if you've taken notes, you can actually put a loose definition to every one of those, you know, together. And then um, I don't think we talked enough about the stoplight, right? It's red. You have no visibility to this. There's mm -hmm. yellow. You have a little bit of visibility to this and there's green. You've confirmed that you have what you need. I think that maybe we, we should have spent a little bit more time on that because that color visualization is what really yep. lets you know where you stand in a deal. Yeah. So red, no information. Yellow is, um, think of it as assumption. I think I know versus I know. Um, think of it as, you know, um, I've gotten some information, but it's not complete or it hasn't been validated client side by the people it needs to be. Green is, um, think it's I know, and it's also client side validated. That's, that's the, important part here is like the, the, the client agrees with you um then you know it's actually complete and you're not just making assumptions uh and how long did it take me to learn all this uh to get to the point i am right now uh, you know only like 10 years it's not a big deal um right um, <laughs> but, uh, to, to get to a point where you can be functionally you know pretty darn good at this work you know 10 15 20 deals like so a quarter maybe six months yeah Got it. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And I think one, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was just this framework, because I think it's so valuable. At the same time, I know it can be intimidating. So I'm glad we got an opportunity to um, address that because it does not have to be that intimidating. And the thing that you mentioned there again is that client side validation. We make assumptions as sellers all the time, and those assumptions get uh, those assumptions get us into big trouble. So you don't have to make the assumptions. These are the, the things that you need to solve for. And you have an objective tool to look at whether or not they've been, they've been solved for. Um, it's really that simple. David, thank you for continuing to bring your engineering mindset to this art that we call selling. There's a lot of science in it too, uh, but we need to be reminded of that. So I appreciate you being here, buddy. Thanks. If you want to learn more about these gap analysis tools for uh, your deals, then go follow David. Um, he's got a wealth of knowledge. He's been working on this, like he said, for 10 years or so. And uh, he just knows the ins and outs of systems like this. And here's the thing. Every once in a while, I'll pick up the phone. And I'll be like, David, I got you stumped. Here's something that you haven't accounted for in your system. And he's like, nope, it's under P or it's under E or something like that. So he really has thought about this from every angle. And that's uh, one of the benefits of his sales brain. So, um, you know, he and I like to get into uh, debates and arguments about stuff like this. Uh, I think it makes us both better. I've talked about that before on this show, actually. Um, but uh, he's a worthwhile follow. He will make you think differently. That's why you come to shows like this. And uh, yeah, just go ahead, check it out. I think it'll do you well. And look, we would always be well served to not be making so many assumptions in our deals. If I had a nickel for every deal I felt good about that didn't come through, um, I'd have a lot of nickels. Let's just say that. So if you can eliminate those assumptions and uh, confirm them, and sometimes the best confirmation you can get is that you don't have what you need, then look into a system like this. It doesn't take very long. Um, that's the end. This is a quick section here on step six to sell like you. Moving into step seven, which is keep your swagger. Uh, I've got a few episodes to record on that. I'm really excited to have come this far through this season of the Rethink the Way You Sell podcast. This seven steps to sell like you framework uh, for me, as I've been developing it here for this show, I've also been developing it with my clients and I love the way it's going. So you will certainly not, or you certainly have not heard the end of this framework as it is. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about swagger in next week's episode and the few beyond. And I'll talk to you again soon. Rethink the Way You Sell is a Pot About It production. 
It's mixed and edited by Doug Branson, with music by Blue Dot Sessions and Doug Branson. This podcast is masterminded by Jeff Bajorek.